So let me read this uh, short uh, profile of uh, Dr. Kiwani. He is a professor of African Christianity and Theology at Liverpool Hope University. He received his PhD in theology from Luther Seminary in St. Paul, and he is the author of Sent Forth African Missionary Work in the West. Okay, so please welcome Dr. Harvey Kiwani. I'm speaking about theological hybridity. Oh. Hybridity in terms of theological conversations in the diaspora. I am Malawian, uh, grew up in Malawi, and have ended up working in Europe and North America extensively for the past 18 years now. And, and when I first moved from Malawi to Switzerland, which is where I started my missions work in Europe, one of the things that really surprised me was simply the fact that I had left Malawi at a time when Malawi was experiencing a great revival. Churches were being birthed and, and, and growing at, at alarming speeds. Found myself in St. Gallen, North Switzerland. Christianity felt almost non-existent. And I began to wonder, in this day and age, is God doing something that could bring what's happening in Africa and what's happening in Europe in a conversation that would, that would help both sides? As, as, I, as I thought about that, then I, I began to notice many African churches that were developing in Europe at the time, and they're still developing until now, uh, by, by their hundreds every year. And they are emerging and they are growing as, as we speak today, as I speak to you today, uh, out of the probably 10 most, 10 largest congregations in Europe, more than half of those will be African. Of course, the largest is African led in Kiev, led by Sandia Adelaja, a Nigerian. The largest congregation in the UK is uh, the Kingsway International in London, um, Nigerian-led, 12,000 members, and it's growing. But, but when you go into some, many of these churches, you, you find only African Christians. There is no, there's no cross-cultural connection with what's happening in the context. And so I, I began to wonder, African churches are growing in Europe. When European churches in Europe are dying, selling out their buildings to become nursing homes and, and pubs. And that led me to even begin to ask what's happening theologically here. Uh, the, 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 the place that I went to automatically was the theology of the Holy Spirit, a pneumatology. Is the African reading of the scriptures in terms of pneumatology helping their Christianity grow uh, in, in, in ways that is not happening in Europe at all? And, and of course, that became my research question for my master's, continued to be my research question for the PhD. But for the PhD, which informs the essay that, that I have here, the research was now exploring what theological conversations are happening between Africans and Americans when they go to the same churches, attend the same services in, 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 in Minnesota. Now Minnesota, Minnesota is home to, to, to many Africans, many Kenyans, many Tanzanians, Liberians, Sierra Leoneans. It's, it's not difficult to find an African congregation in, in Minnesota. But, but Minnesota is also part of the Lutheran belt. That's, that's home to many Lutherans. And, and, and for the research, I, I decided to look at Lutheran congregations in, in St. Paul and Minneapolis, especially those Lutheran congregations that had Africans and, and, and Americans meeting together. And, and 
really try and find out, are they talking to one another theologically? Are they informing one another theologically? And if this is happening, what are they talking about? Uh, and so I engaged several congregations, um, had a lot of focus group conversations, a lot of interviews, um, I had a bit of a questionnaire, and, and really just trying to find out, are, th are, are they talking to one another in terms of theology? And what are they talking about? It became very clear very early in, in the process that the Africans and the Americans, even though they have been in the same congregations for a long time, they don't talk to one another theologically. In, in some cases, uh, there was no other platform where they could engage one another apart from the Sunday morning service. Everything else that was happening in their churches was culturally divided or racially divided. The Africans did their own thing here and the, the Americans did their own thing there. The Asians did their own thing there. While, of course, it was mostly white American theology that was shaping what was happening in, this con in, in these congregations. And, and so I began to wonder, really, if the Africans were allowed or were courageous enough to begin to contribute to the theologies of their congregations, would things look differently? Now, this was, this was my assumption going into the research, that really, if, if the Africans are able to contribute, some things will sound differently in their congregation. Some things will be done differently. These are, these are good Lutherans in, in, in the Lutheran bed. And, and, and we're looking at Kenyan Lutherans and Tanzanian Lutherans in the same congregations. When the Kenyan Lutherans or the Tanzanian Lutherans met by themselves, their services were full of music, dancing, uh, everything you can think of. When they went to their churches on Sunday, all that had to be left out. They had to behave like proper Lutherans. And, 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 and they had to... You know, they're living with this schizophrenia for, for, for many years. They will, they will, actually, out of necessity, have their own spaces where they can, they, they go to church on Sunday morning and behave like good Lutherans. And, and in the afternoon, they go for their own African Lutheran fellowship. That will be entirely different. And, and, and really, I began to wonder, is this thing that's happening when they are by themselves of any good if they find ways to communicate that to their congregations? Could they share a part, a, just a little bit of this enthusiasm with their American counterparts? Could, could the Americans learn something of the work of the spirit from the Africans? And maybe could the Africans learn something of order and, and other things in, 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 in the American congregations. As I said, they were, not, they were not talking to one another at all. American white theology was being preached. The Africans would, 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 would hear that, but when they have to express their, their faith, they live out their, their Christian life, they would keep on drawing from their African upbringing, African experiences. They would need to be in African congregations to, to, to enjoy this. And that made me begin to wonder, so what, what would happen? Why, and, and why is this not happening at all? Now, my, my father is an agriculturalist. A tea farmer, uh, and and growing up on a tea farm, you hear you hear a lot of biological agricultural terms. 
So cross-pollination and hybridity were, were, were part of my vocab growing up. And, and, and what, what, what that taught me was simply the fact that sometimes you need variety to move things forward. In, in Malawi, as, if, even as I speak today, uh, and this is part of the colonial residue of, of, of British culture in Malawi. When we see a, a, a good, fat-looking chicken, it's, it's a hybrid chicken, we, 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 we'll call that uh, a, a Western chicken. The, the small native ones, those ones, we'll call them African chickens. And, 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 and we do that not just with, with animals, even with, even with crops. I spoke to my dad just a few days ago, and he was telling me about how he, he acquired a hybrid type of maize uh, back in the 90s that he holds on until today, that he makes sure that it's not, it's not cross-pollinated with other types of maize. Every year by year, he wants to keep that pure because that, that type of maize is is better, more resistant to drought or rain or many other things. It, it yields better, better crops than, than, than the local maize. And that's what, that's what hybridity does to us sometimes. That when we, when we get bits of the genes from here and bits of the genes from there, we are able to overcome some of the things that hold us back. And, 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 and so for, for for an agriculturally minded like mine, this becomes something that I find very promising, even theologically. Because on the one hand, of course, all theology is contextual. We, we, uh, we, we, we are beyond thinking that one theology is, is, is something that will cover the whole earth. Doesn't make sense. It doesn't work anymore. If, even even Western theology is is contextual theology. It's it's, and and we have to treat it like that sometimes, because I'm teaching at a, at, at 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 a university now, I have African students that can quote all the Western theologians, but don't know even one African theologian, and I'm wondering really what's what's going on here. We we have to move beyond just believing that one theology will answer all our theological questions. Every theology is answering questions that are pertinent to the people that are engaging with, with God in their contexts. So African theology is answering questions that, that, uh, that African Christians are, are wrestling with. Sitting down with Professor Andrew Woz, a name that you probably know, he, 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 he looks at me one of the days and says, you, you need to understand that Western theology is, is too little for world Christianity now. In that it, it, it doesn't know what to do with the issues of spiritual warfare and witchcraft that the Africans are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And, 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 and I find that really helpful, that Africans are dealing with their issues. Asians are dealing with their issues. Latin Americans are dealing with their issues. God is working in their lives, in their context, bringing them to truths that are relevant for their, for their context. And it is only when, as a global body of Christ, Latin American, Asian, African, European, as a global body of Christ, that we get together in a conversation that we begin to see and understand God better. All our theologies have blind spots. There are issues that I sit down with my, 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 my European friends and, and they're talking theology and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, why are you guys struggling with this? If this was in Africa, we would have resolved it in this way and it, it wouldn't be an issue at all, right? That's Holy Spirit. 
and, 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 and also I'm aware that there are times when we Africans are wrestling with issues that our Western friends look at us and say, why is this an issue at all? We could resolve it in this way. And it is, it is in this informing one another theologically that we are able to begin to see God better as, as Christ's body of Christ on earth. We know for sure that Abraham got his revelation of God in the process of migration, in the process of moving from one place to another. And, and we live in a world here today where Christian migration is, is, is the thing. That I... I I don't have to come to the Philippines to meet Filipino Christians. I meet them in London, in Liverpool, all the time. And it's the same for you. You don't need to go to Kenya to meet African Christians. You meet them wherever you are, all the time. God, God is somehow remixing the nations, if I can use that word, in that his Christianity has grown much, much more than expected in, 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 in Africa, in Latin America, and in some parts of Asia. Uh, in Africa, uh, just, just between 1970 and today, Christianity has grown from 100 million to 600 million. That's ne that kind of growth has never happened in the history of Christianity before. But at the same time that African Christianity is exploding, there is also an explosion of African migration. And it's mostly the African Christians that are migrating with their Christianity, with their theology. All right? People migrate with their theologies. People migrate with their understanding of God. Uh, in, in most cases, the process of migration itself is, is built around a belief that God is with me as I migrate. Right, I read an article just this week about somebody who has collected uh, rosaries across the, the Texas-Mexico border for years. Uh, lots and lots and lots of rosaries that, that, that have been collected from would-be migrants. Just, just, just suggesting that in the process of migration itself, this rosary, a symbol of God's presence with me as I migrate, becomes important. And so people migrate with their theologies. The African Lutherans in, in Minnesota are not necessarily a tabula rasa that, 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 uh, that's come empty so that it, just, it, it should just keep on receiving from Western theology. They've come, they've, come, they've brought with their theologies with them. And it, given space, having the courage, they would contribute they would help shape, they would help my American friends begin to see God differently, begin to understand God differently, begin to understand God from the perspectives of an, an African migrant who is struggling to, to raise a family in, in, in a strange land and how, how they hold on to just this simple belief that God is here with us and he is going to make things better for us one day. That, 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 just that kind of thinking, that, that flips a different light in, in terms of theological conversations. How, how do we do theology from a migrant's perspective? How do we do theology from a, a, a poor person's perspective? How do we do theology from a African, Hispanic, Asian perspective, even as we live together in the West? Malawians, I'm taking you back to Malawi. We, so this is Africa. We, we, have, we have folk stories and, and, and proverbs and and that's how we communicate our wisdom, so to speak. And one of those for us simply says, the guest 
always comes with, in, in, in literal translation, it comes with a pocket knife. And the pocket knife is uh, quite critical for these people, at least back in the day, in that it, it, would, it would cut through all the things that, would, that hinder the, the community's progress. So, well, I mean, Africans living back then, the pocket knife would answer almost all your questions. If you needed, if you needed something, if you, the pocket knife would do it for you. You need an arrow, you just cut a tree, you, you sharpen it one end, that's an arrow for you. The pocket knife does it for you. But the pocket knife is a pocket knife because it is hidden. Right? So you don't really know that the guest has a, uh, has a pocket knife up until you ask for it. Right. And, 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 and so, in, 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 in saying that the guest has a pocket knife, what, what they are saying is the guest always sees your life through a different perspective. And it may be the perspective that you need to resolve your issues. Am I making sense? The guest comes with, with a different type of knowledge that will help you answer your questions. You, you always, as I said, we all have theological blind spots. You always need somebody to, to show you something that you can't see because this is how we live here. And the guest gives you that. He, he, brings, you, he brings you that. He, he helps you see things that you could not see otherwise. But, 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 but also, an, another proverb says, if you are alone, you are, not, you are not a human being. To be a human being, you need to be in a company of somebody who is different from you. Now, tying it down to theology, We always see in part. We prophesy in part. Everything is just as we see it. So we need, we need, we need one another. We need different perspectives to help us see God, understand God better. Theology is faith-seeking understanding. But that understanding is always better if it is different perspectives shining the same light on, on the same thing. Such that, as, as, as in the image of a mosaic, that can only become alive, that can only be what it is if, if the different colors are put in together in, in the right places. And, and I think this is what God is doing now. In that he's bringing us together in ways that our theologians can engage in a conversation that mutually enriches and critiques both of them. That on the one hand, on the one hand, we, are enriched by engaging people that are different from us, but on the other, we are also open to critique from people that are different from us. And it is in this, in this tension between mutually edifying and mutually critiquing that we are encouraged, we are helped to see God better. My time is up, thank you.